um, a couple of my obsessions and addictions. And uh, these are things that have sort of uh, educated me in the last three to five years. And um, I'm hoping that by sharing these stories, you might be able to take one or two things uh, away. Um, the first addiction I have is water. Um, let's see, I think we have a, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Kunle. <laughs> I'm a waterholic. <laughs> um, I mean, it's very interesting to think about water uh, because um, water, of course, is a, uh, you know, it's, it's what everybody is familiar with in the world. And uh, of course, you, you might know that 70% of the world uh, of the earth is covered by water. And uh, it's something that we take for granted quite a lot. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's always around us. Uh, and it's uh, with the changing conditions of the world now, it's become one of the most important elements that will uh, actually reshape uh, the future. Um, the other addiction I have currently is uh, our, our cities. Um, somehow, I think the development of cities has become almost a trend now. You find cities uh, expanding very quickly. You find cities, the lifespan of a city being almost um, faster than lifespan of a human being. So a city, for instance, like Abuja, that is less than, that is about 40 years old, is probably looking more mature than myself. Uh, and, um, and, you know, so cities have become, like someone said, man's greatest invention. Uh, and I think what's also interesting is that uh, we have to be very careful because cities can also be man's deadliest invention. Um, there are, so in a way, th these two things, um, these two elements for me bring uh, together a condition that I call water cities. Um, and it is no real news when we talk about water cities because nearly 70% of the world capitals are actually around, sit, uh, around water. So the large cities all around um, uh, the continent and all around uh, the world are really located uh, around water. But that's not, again, maybe not great news because um, of course, one of the earliest uh, civilizations in uh, Mesopotamia was situated around water. And that's because, you know, historically people have to trade, have to, you know, move around. Um, and uh, the Fertile Crescent is where the claim to civilization happened uh, or began. And that's, of course, because there's uh, water there for irrigation, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, historically, water and cities have played a very important role. Um, and jumping to 2000 and whatever, we have uh, cities and people developing um, cities like this because of course waterfront uh, developments are uh, perhaps the most expensive real estates anywhere in the world, again. Um, so um, the, you know, and we also sort of go, I've been around, so I've spent quite a bit of time trying to understand this um, relationship between the city and water. And I've been fortunate to also live in Amsterdam and I've spent a lot of time traveling to different parts of the world trying to understand why there's this fascination or what the relationship is between uh, cities and water. And this is Amsterdam, you know, they've got even to a point where You've got concerts on water now. Uh, Thailand, you know, you've got floating cities everywhere. Um, there are parts in Senegal that, you know, you have islands already built locally out of uh, seashells. Uh, or in Mexico, you know, co uh, communities that get flooded and then, you know, um, they, they get settled dry again. And, um, and you've also got in Peru very little uh, communities that are built uh, from reeds uh, and um, sometimes the reeds, you know, after a while they get rotten and 
you have to basically reconstitute your uh, little city again uh, every uh, 30 years. Um, and that's how they get around. Uh, lovely city animal. Um, so um, nearly 70% of the world's population will be living in cities uh, by 2050. More than half of the world's population is live, uh, lives in, on, in cities now, as you know. So urbanization is a big, big issue. Uh, and uh, coupled with that, of course, the image I showed previously of a uh, city is New York. Uh, and what you see here is the same image taken from the same angle uh, on the day Hurric um, Sandy Storm struck where half of New York was shut down uh, by the storm. So you see that dark spot, there's you know, no NEPA. Uh, for those <laughs> uh, this is New York. I mean, this is like the cradle of uh, civilization and you know, development. And suddenly, there's no water. There's no NEPA. There's no. So somehow, the environment is able to sort of conquer uh, human development, uh, as we are beginning to see. Um, so let's move down to Africa, uh, which is actually my third obsession lately. Um, and what you may or may not know is that uh, although Africa is said to be the least responsible for climate change, it is actually the most affected by it with um, more than, uh, with a large area of it within the high to extreme high risk zones. So what we're seeing are these very radical changes in the environment. So when we talk about climate change, uh, you know, we talk about CO2 emissions, we talk about radiations, we talk about all, the, all these kinds of things. That don't mean anything to most of us. You know, yeah, I mean, okay, so climate change. I'm not in, we're not really bothered by that. But what we begin, what we've started seeing that really affects people on a day-to-day -day basis is water, flooding, increased rainfall, you know, if you live in most parts of these cities in Africa, you find these kinds of conditions happening more and more often. And what's very interesting is uh, on, on that side, you see those guys you know, trying to struggle and deal with the situation. And interestingly enough, these guys seem to be trying to conquer it. <laughs> and, um, but that's, for me, very exciting because uh, it tells me a lot about the African spirit. where immediately they are already having a great time, already learning to adapt. They're very resilient people. We're very, um, you know, we, all, we basically just find, use challenges, learn from the challenges, and create new opportunities and solve uh, uh, problems. So this is where my work is sort of situated in trying to understand these uh, conditions and trying to understand them from environmental, social, economic uh, points of views. Um, and again, focusing on Africa, 70% uh, again, there's something wrong with 70% or something right about it, but again, nearly 70% of African capital cities are by water. Um, so the major cities, again, all along the coast, uh, we've uh, discovered. So we began this research, and we began trying to understand what's going on, you know, to learn to, you know, see what the conditions are, uh, looking at the flood affected areas. We did a very extensive mapping um, of uh, the GDP growth rate, the population patterns, the uh, development migration trends in Africa, and uh, sort of brought all this information together uh, to identify um, what we call the top 20 um, African water cities. These are cities where um, they are sort of growing rapidly. So what you see is sort of a ranking here from Lagos to Kinshasa, Cairo, Khartoum. It's a ranking that, uh, it's our ranking basically, but it identifies these conditions where um, the two issues meet um, of, for the African Water Cities Project, which is a research project that investigates the points of intersection of the issues of rapid urbanization cities uh, and climate change, water, flooding, you know, drought, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking into these uh, cities and the communities around them to learn from those environments and be inspired 
um, by uh, how they are adapting locally and how um, they uh, will be uh, transformed in the next uh, decades. So that's essentially the uh, model, uh, Water Cities uh, project. Uh, and of course, it's, it's again, uh, for most of, for people that may not have been uh, to different African countries um, or African cities, they are not, um, I, I hate to disappoint you, they are not jungles. Uh, you, uh, you won't find safaris in many of these cities. Uh, you will not find lions. You will find uh, civilized or at least developed uh, areas like Cape Town, Dakar, uh, Abidjan, Luanda, um, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Accra, Kutunu, etc., and of course Lagos. Um, wow, I see some enthusiasts here. <laughs> how many? How many? How many people have? How many, how many Africans do we have here? Just by the way, how many? Wow. Okay. Wow. I mean, there are some people missing, but really, I mean, being an African doesn't mean you are. You have to be born there. You can be an Afropolitan, and all kinds of words now. Af Afro lover, Afromaniac, <laughs> Aphrodisiac. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anyway, so if you are, and for so for those of you, I mean, I I, I was told we we're going to do some dancing here, so I brought some Afro me some some music, which I thought. Um, to, to get you guys started. And of course, uh, I'm um, talking about Lagos that has grown very rapidly, uh, where the birth of all kinds of cultures have emerged. How many people recognize that tone? Yeah? Yeah, really? OK. Nice, nice. Some, someone guess? Yeah? It's, um, it's, uh, it's, so you know the title, yeah? Have you listened to everything completely? I think it's a place to learn a lot about water. We're going to be dancing soon after this. I just thought to get you into the mood. Um, and Fela is a you know, great Afrobeat legend. He talked about, a lot about water in a very strange way. I don't know what obsessed him like myself, but uh, he's, he's taught us quite a bit there, something to learn. Um, and it's, you know, Lagos, again, is a, very, uh, is a very typical city, African city, where nearly 30% of the surface area of Lagos is covered by water. That means 70% again is covered by land. Okay, so, uh, and that water is sort of underutilized. And in fact, what you think is the heart of Lagos is actually a body of water. So, you know, that's why you have this major traffic because you're trying to go from one end and you can't go to the other end. There's this fissure in the geographical construct of the city. And hopefully, if there's a connection at that point, you would create a ring road in the future that would allow circulation through this city and maybe the heart of the city would become uh, much more of a water city. Uh, in that heart, we um, discovered a community that is already living uh, like that. Uh, not Victoria Island, um, but uh, a community right next to it called Makoko. Um, I'll go very quickly through this because I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this project, which uh, essentially was started at a point that I began uh, a company called Inlay, my company, which means at home, and I was trying to investigate and research affordable housing in Lagos at the time uh, Governor Fashola uh, became, uh, took his second term. And, uh, I decided to go to what I thought was the cheapest dwelling, which is where these uh, Makoko exists. And uh, I learned a great deal from Makoko how to basically build um, a city almost out of nothing, really, um, and how to 
have your Tesco on a boat. Um, and the opportunities within the community, uh, industry, agriculture, transportation, all happening there. At the same time, looking at the challenges uh, within the city, within the community. They have issues of how uh, building properly, sanitation, uh, infrastructure, and of course, education, inadequate uh, infrastructure to provide education. So I was asked to help, and it was at the point I began research and development, uh, working with the community, learning from the local builders, the people that had built all these, like, you know, how do you, what kind of timber do you use, how do you nail the joints, et cetera, et cetera, looking, um, talking to the community quite a bit, and uh, it was a learning experience, and I took that to sort of uh, develop a solution for a, the challenge within a, within a school uh, that was impacted by flooding because it was built on reclaimed land. Um, and the solution was really about look, learning about their local technology, which had challenges because during the rains, uh, they still get slightly flooded uh, because they are on stilts and they have uh, poor foundations. Um, and we decided to create a solution which adapts to the changing levels of the water. Um, and uh, that brought about a, an innovative solution. Mm -hmm. um, well, to just round up, I will show you very quickly um, a project that we're working on which is, again, a next step about understanding the relationship between water and uh, the city. And uh, it's called Chikoko. It's a community uh, on the waterfront in Port Harcourt. Uh, and we uh, are, first, well, first of all, I mean, they don't live on water like Makoko. They actually just live around the edges. Uh, and one of the things that we are looking at is developing an edge condition for them to really use their waterfront uh, and we're working with a, a, a group called CMAP that they've done, learned from the, from the community what their requirements are. Uh, and we looked at all these requirements and one of them included a mast, a radio station. They wanted to have a radio station. We sort of put that together into a building that bridges uh, water and land. So it's a, an amphibious structure that will be seen uh, hopefully by next year which is somewhat a hybrid between uh, a radio station, a media shed, a cinema, a bridge, a performance space, a, a jetty. Uh, programs are already in place, and uh, it's going to be uh, ready uh, as part uh, as one of the things that we're looking into building uh, a new type of architecture and urbanism uh, for water in uh, coastal African cities and waterfront communities. Thank you very much. Thank you.